Welcome back everybody to the Wandering Samurai Studying, which we review and analyze every single act told in we run a Kenshin and today's act is Act 62 on the EC Road. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Kenshin is finally back in uh, the narrative and I like how he's kind of the butt of the joke. He, he's This is our hero that everybody's looking at. He's the one that's going to save Japan and save... Uh, the Meiji, and everybody is just kind of punching him around, kind of uh, taking jabs at him. I freaking love it. Ah, what a what a way to humble our uh, protagonist. <laughs> but seriously, uh, the theme of this chapter and how Kenshin is so committed to not uh, getting attached to others, and everybody actually taking this uh, jab at him that he's he's a poor man who's just wandering around. It kind of speaks volumes to like where we are in the Meiji as a, so as a society compared to when, uh, I don't know, maybe uh, I guess during the Tokugawa where like samurai or the samurai class is kind of revered and and they're kind of the, um, you know, the, uh, the guardians or the warriors of society. And now they're looking at him like, oh, well, he's probably doesn't have any money he's a swordsman but he doesn't want to stay in an inn and he's probably a broke you know uh, I don't know it, it it was just it was humorous but I can see where it goes anyways uh, let's get into the chapter summary review and we'll go into the rest of the chapter because there's a lot to cover here Kenshin is wandering alone on his way to Kyoto, using his sword to ward off any people from getting near him. He's determined to walk the EC road alone to minimize any contact with other people who might be vulnerable to an attack from Shishio. However, this creates some hijinks for the swordsman as people mistake Kenshin's behavior as him being poor and a certain policeman is committed to apprehending him for breaking the sword ban act. After some traveling, Kenshin finds himself setting up camp in a forest wondering about his friends that he left behind in Tokyo when he hears a commotion nearby. Deciding that he cannot ignore it, he rushes to find a young girl conning some men, attacking them and robbing them. Kenshin tells her that it's wrong to steal, and she decides to rob him too. So the first thing that I want to talk about is Saito, because Saito's in this chapter. And one of the things that I noticed about this is that Saito is technically in a flashback. It's, it's Kenshin when he's walking alone, but he's remembering the conversation that he had with Saito. And one of the things that I noticed about this uh, this manga uh, that it does is that whenever there's a flashback or some type of remembrance, the borders become black. And that didn't happen this time. I don't know if it was a stylistic choice, but uh, it's not here. And I'm kind of wondering why. If anybody has any theories, please let me know in the comments. But uh, Saito mentions that he has a boat and that he offers it to Kenshin telling him that he could take him to uh, to Kyoto in a, like super super quick and that him going there is not going to be an issue or him getting there should be really fast and that they can get a jump start on all of this. And uh, Kenshin uh, declines because he has his reasons. And I think that that may actually answer our questions about why Saito is hanging around. Because he knows that he can get to Kyoto really fast. And if that doesn't actually answer our question, uh, he also offers some um, some words that uh, he's actually the one in charge of uh, everything that's going to go down as far as the police is involved in Kyoto. But the way that I more so see it is that Saito is involved of the Shishio case. And not so much the policeman. And so maybe that's the reason that he's hanging around Tokyo. Because anytime that something that may affect the events in Kyoto occurs. He's there to kind of stick his nose in it. Because now he's in charge of what's going on. I don't know. I, I, I'm, I'm just trying to kind of bridge the gap between why Saito is hanging around. But if that's not enough, I, I, I don't know. It's good enough for me for... Uh, for now, anyways. And in this chapter, we actually see uh, Saito and Kenshin about to almost kind of fight with each other, telling them that like, oh, bring it on, bub, whenever you want, I'll, I'll, I'll accept the challenge from you. And this, um, this I really, really like just because it, Saito isn't going away. And I like that Saito isn't going away because it's basically forcing these two characters and this very hostile dynamic that they have with one another that they don't get along but they have to put aside their differences for the greater good of 
the Meiji and society itself and the nation itself. It's like really cool. It's just, man, like Kyoto just really steps up its game and and Saito and Kenshin having to team up and this despite having completely different philosophies and different approaches on how to even get to Kyoto. Uh it's it's just it's just so cool. <laughs> I I like the relationship between Saito and Kenshin. And uh so with that, let's go ahead and talk about Kenshin. I think I really like that Kenshin is going on this emotional journey uh to save the world, but at the same time he's very much in a conflict and uh and he's struggling with his um with himself and uh it i feel like this is really the first time that we get to see Kenshin at a uh i guess have some kind of character growth because it seems that like at least as as Tokyo goes his basic character arc is is pretty much over he's pretty much come to terms with who he is and how he wants to live the rest of his life and there have been people who come and challenge that worldview of his, but he's nonetheless remained the same character and only shows those people that oppose him that what he is doing is the right thing. Um, but now there's a force that's kind of come into, into the, into the scene and he's grappling with it. He doesn't know if he's strong enough or he's good enough but he's committed to staying the same and uh and holding his values of being a wanderer or not no excuse me not a wanderer but atoning for his uh his sins by never killing again so him committing to not traveling with other people so that other people remain safe is Kenshin expressing those um that commitment and uh and kind of staying true to to that because he doesn't want anybody else getting hurt if he can help it. And him knowing that the Shishio faction is aware that he's going to Kyoto to uh, to fight Shishio. Anybody else getting involved with him is kind of put at a high risk. And it's the reason that he chose to go to Kyoto by himself. And so it would make sense that he would uh, not want to get involved with other people. And not stay at an inn or not travel by boat or, or whatever, you know. And it's almost funny that the that the moment that he chooses to ignore this and decides that there's something that he can't overlook it's the moment that it kind of all comes crashing down on him and you know the the young girl kind of comes in and she's very spunky and she's you know ready to rob him but we'll get into her in just a moment because i really want to quickly shout out the ec road uh I like that in, in this chapter, there was a little kind of box that kind of explained what the EC road. I think there is even a, a drawing that uh, the author put into the into the chapter. It kind of explaining all the stops that are along the EC road and how it was something that had a lot of people at it at one point. But because of the Meiji and the technological, technological, <clears throat> technological advances, this is a much more safer road and it's something that has basically survived into the Meiji and it's a, a remnant of the past that is available but not widely used anymore. And that's pretty cool. Uh, it's pretty cool that it was inserted into the story and kind of given a little bit of a blurb so that if people don't know, you know, in the modern era where things had just advanced so much since, you know, the 1800s, you could know about it. I was like, hey, fun fact, this is a thing that's real and Kenshin's using it. And so let's go ahead and finish off the chapter by talking about Misao. Uh, Misao's here. Uh, we finally get to see Misao. Um, we don't know her by name yet. But like like I said, though, like the moment that Kenshin decides to ignore his one rule that he seems to be very stern on, uh, it all comes crashing down on him. And we see this real spunky girl and just the introduction of her and the way that she basically lured these men and and Kenshin and the audience is believing that the men are gonna you know do unspeakable things to her she turns the tables on them and <laughs> oh how the turntables um she turns the tables on them and you know it was her the one who was actually springing the trap and uh she's gonna be somebody a little bit more interesting because now she's committed to even robbing Kenshin she's she's bold enough to rob our main character and uh that's that's a uh, it's an interesting setup for a character so we'll see where that goes next time
But for now, this has been Act 62 of Peroni Kenshin. If you like this video and you want to see more, then consider subscribing to the channel. Leave a thumbs up and comment down below something that you liked about this chapter. What do you think about uh, the East Sea Road? What do you think about Saito being in charge? And what do you think of all the, all the jabs that we're taking at our protagonist, Kenshin? Let me know in the comments down below. I will see you then. Bye, cha. Hello. Hello. Hello.